unpleasant odors? You have just been invaded by Sega TV! Tonight, we bring you... Wildlife! This is Megan, star of a new Sega game. Megan! What's it like to be a Mega CD star? Real tough. You try dying 2,000 times a day. Hey, you! Yeah, you! Billy from Romford. You don't zap her on my show. The weather. The weather is... I say you could do this move. Commercial break. Sega Mega Drive. Got one. Now you can get Mega CD. Right click, take the trip. Whoa! It comes with seven games that even plays your music, CD. Okay, Megan, let's get interactive. <laughs> <laughs> now that's what I call Mega CD. Um. Uh. Huh. Good. Sega, you're so weird. Particularly in the 16-bit era, where the goal was to stick as much stuff as possible to your console. Now we've talked about one of these before, the 32X, an odd looking device which you put in the cartridge slot, but there was a more well known add-on called the Sega CD. Now there was different models for each version of the Mega Drive, and it's perhaps the most well known early console to use CDs even if not many people seem to actually own one, probably because of the high price point. Combining both the 32X and the Mega CD would cost a fortune, and you'd have to deal with the embarrassment of the mutants of a console you now owned. That being said, the Sega CD has an important part in gaming history, as being one of the sparks that fueled the biggest and most influential gaming rivalries that to this day has a lasting effect on the industry. For this is... Nintendo versus Sony. Seeing the rivalry in today's modern gaming between these two, you'd be forgiven for not realising that at one point they were working quite closely together. In contrast, today they're often throwing cheap comments at each other. You can also see the remnants of the partnership in the company's similar thinking. Thus why Sony often does what Nintendo does. At least a lot of the time. Seriously, Sony, come up with something original. Obviously, this partnership didn't last, and because of it, the modern gaming world is very different from what it could have been. The rivalry it created and the aftermath altered the very future of gaming. But enough about that. Let's see how this whole thing happened in the first place. Our tale starts in the year 1988. The Famicom and the NES are dominating the gaming world, and Nintendo are at the top of their game. Meanwhile, the General Electronics Japanese company, Sony, was desperate to enter the now steadily recovering gaming industry. Meet Ken Kutaragi, a young Sony engineer. One day, he went and bought a Famicom for his kids, and while he could see how games had a promising future, he was left unimpressed with the technology, and thus a cunning plan formed. And so, in hope of breaking into their sought-after market, Ken Kutaragi and some other people from Sony travelled to Nintendo HQ with a proposition for them. He went to the management and presumably in typical hip cool down with the kids Sony fashion was all Yo Nintendo, Sony is in the house and what's in on this gaming thing in dog word. To which Nintendo's response was Uh sure. Yeah, whatever. Just just don't break anything, okay? Success! Just like that, Sony had managed to get their foot in the door of the gaming industry, and managed to sign a deal with Nintendo. With the successor of the NES approaching, Sony would now build and supply the audio chips for the Super Nintendo. Now, Sony was quite pleased with this deal, 
since they secretly designed them to make decent sound developments only possible with expensive Sony tools. But Sony wasn't just satisfied with that one deal. Wait, what's that sound? Can you hear that? A CD! Well, then it can only be one thing. The future! Yes, back in the day, the now commonplace CD was a mystical future creation. And it looked like it was going to be the route gaming was going to go down. Nintendo realised this, for they had in fact already invested in CDs a couple of years before. Meet the Famicom Disk System. Released in 1986, it was a device that attached to the base of the Famicom. Or, if you were lucky, you might get one which was already built in. Which, by the way, this thing looks, in my professional opinion, badass. Now, this system was home to a lot of big names, including the original Legend of Zelda and what would become Super Mario Bros. 2 here, Doki Doki Panic. So, if lots of big games were on the system, why didn't we get a Nintendo Entertainment System disc system? Well, apart from the terrible name, the device had a habit of breaking a lot, sometimes melting, and being generally unreliable. That's how we got many disc games on cartridge instead. And so it was branded a failure by Nintendo, although they continued to support repairs for it until 2004. The president of Nintendo was confident CDs were the route to go down. And now, CD gaming technology was gaining more public attention, particularly in the West and with other games companies. Nintendo was taking notice of this. While not confident in their Famicom disc system, they were determined to do it again and do it right with their next console. And Sony discovering this were very keen to use Nintendo's interest to their advantage, basically telling them, Yo, we can like so do this CD thing for you. Nintendo innocently thought it would be a good idea, considering how Sony had delivered on their promise for the sound chips, and invited them to strike up a new deal. So, both the heads of Sony and Nintendo met together to sign this deal. It was proposed that it would not simply build an add-on for the Super Nintendo, but instead create an entirely new console together, with the ability to play both SNES cartridges and new CD games. It seemed like a great idea, a chance for Sony to make their own console with the help of the most successful maker of them, and gave Nintendo the disk drive system they were hoping for. But of course things are never simple. Now, perhaps Nintendo were just too excited, or trustworthy of Sony, but they probably should have read into the contract they were signing a little closer, for Sony had a plan in motion. An evil plan. With the contract sorted, the console was dubbed the rather simple name of the Super Disc, and it was going to be made using both Nintendo and Sony's super secret technology that was supposedly 18 months from being released. As previously stated, it was going to be able to play both Super Nintendo cartridges and the CD-ROMs. The CDs Sony would be sole worldwide licensor of. With all this agreed upon and development ready to go, it seemed like everything was sorted. What could possibly go wrong? Well, okay, it didn't instantly crash and burn. In fact, for the most part, the first few years went fine and dandy. Both companies were working hard together to get this new system ready to show off. Nintendo was so confident in both CD technology and the project that they increased the research budget to help explore what they could do with it further. It wasn't until 1991, the year of the Super Nintendo release, that things went sour. And by sour I mean like a thousand lemons smacking you in the face repeatedly. Nintendo went back and looked at the deal they signed with Sony when they realised something that caused them alarm. A great deal of it. Nintendo must have felt awful about the mistake when they realised it. Sony's lawyers had skillfully manipulated the contract, so Sony got all control and licensing rights to the CD-based games, meaning they'd reap in all the publishing profits, the very profits Nintendo needed to keep. Realising this crazy CD thing was in no way a fluke and could create major business, Nintendo realised their alliance with Sony meant giving up a lot of their own business. 
this was something Nintendo could simply not let happen, and decided to fight Sony's cunning plan with a cunning plan of their own. And so they rushed off to find a solution. June 1991, two months before the Super Nintendo's US release, its first appearance on display at the Chicago CES. It was also going to be the reveal of the new system the two companies were working on within Sony's event during the show. Taking the stage, Sony proudly announced their partnership and gave the world a glimpse of the new console. Named the Nintendo PlayStation. Now, you'll have to forgive me here since I've no idea what the console officially looked like because as you can see there's a lot of different designs throughout development. The one you see centre stage seems to be however the most consistent with magazine articles from the time. But if you ever wondered why the PlayStation controller is basically a Super Nintendo one with some handles, a couple more buttons and some control sticks, well here's your answer. It originally WAS a Super Nintendo controller. The PlayStation wasn't just there to play games and look pretty though, it would also play music and movies via Sony using other parts of its vast company to develop software. It was quite the surprise and gained a lot of attention, Sony left the stage very pleased. Fast forward 24 hours though and Nintendo had had all it could take. Sony had also retained all the rights to the Super Nintendo sound chip, forcing Nintendo more under their control. Time to put their revenge into action. At 9am, the day after Sony's reveal, Nintendo took the stage and showed off the Super Nintendo as planned, and then made a surprise announcement. In their attempt to get back at Sony, Nintendo had travelled to the mysterious European country known as the Netherlands. They announced instead of working with Sony, they were now working with Philips, Sony's long-time rival on a SNES CD, claiming their technology was superior. Nintendo played the old card of the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Sony was humiliated and furious having found out about this the night before, trying to get in contact only to have their calls ignored. This could create serious backlash against Nintendo since they broke their contract and Sony tried to change their mind by threatening to sue, but Nintendo insisted to them that I'll deal with Philips won't interfere with your little PlayStation thing which Sony begrudgingly accepted for now, since both companies still needed to maintain friendly relationships. The deal that was struck with Philips did seem like a much better one than the one with Sony, at least on paper. Philips agreed to develop a SNES CD drive and would give Nintendo full licensing control over the entire thing. In return, Philips also wanted to make a games console and Nintendo agreed they could use Nintendo characters and games for the new system. So now everything was looking a bit more promising, at least Philips or Sony would develop a CD drive for the Super Nintendo. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? around here. Ha <laughs> ha! Here's the problem. Too many toasters. You know what they say? All toasters toast toast. Oh. And only Link can defeat Ganon. Great! I'll grab my stuff! There is no time. Your sword is enough. Enough. My ship sails in the morning. I wonder what's for dinner. Oh boy! I'm so hungry, I could eat an Octorok! Oopsie made lots of spaghetti! Luigi, look! It's from Bowser! Dear pesky plumbers! Oh. Oh no!